Thank you for inviting me. I'm Tutul. I'm from Bangladesh. I'm an exiled Bangladeshi publisher, writer, and editor in Norway. On October 31st, 2015, for publishing some books that were critical of religion and social taboos, and for my own religious disbelief, I was attacked with a machete and firearms by radical Islamists who intended to kill me. I was seriously injured and survived because two writer friends happened to be with me that day and protected me. But I'm not any popular atheist from the point of view of Bangladesh. Our panel today is about censorship, offense, and free speech. I want to start by mentioning the recent student uprising in Bangladesh. During this movement, more than 600 young students were killed by law enforcement and the ruling party, the Awami League. Some reports say the numbers killed may be over 1,000, and over 10,000 were seriously injured. Despite this spontaneous student movement without any political backing, managed to overthrow the more powerful prime minister who had been in power for 15 years, she eventually had to flee the country. For those 15 years, the Bangladesh was under a dictatorship with one party rule. There was a no tolerance for dissent and freedom of speech and the press were severely restricted. People lived in fear. The whole country was trapped in a web of visible and invisible censorship. Those who spoke out were persecuted, with many jailed, disappeared, or killed. Corruption thrived, marked under the development, and large amount of money were smuggled of the country. The National Intelligence Service was involved in all kinds of conspiracies, the state manipulated religious sentiment and allowed the persecution of anyone who criticized Islam. There was a campaign against bloggers, writers, and publishers labeled as atheists, many of whom were killed, including Abhijit Roy, Anuntu Bijoy Dash, Ahmed Rajiv Haider, Faisal Arifin Dipon, and many more. The Prime Minister refused to provide security to anyone who criticized religion, making it unsafe for anyone to speak out against the status quo. The authoritarian regime created a crisis of disappear, inequality, and hopelessness. The inability of protest or vote led the widespread dissatisfaction and anger among the people. This anger was felt by almost everyone, except for a few beneficiaries. This environment of censorship and inequality created a cultural gap, making people vulnerable to extremism. Over the last 15 years, various fundamentalist Islamist group in Bangladesh have gained power, exploiting this gap and influencing many ordinary people by offering an alternative. In a country where free speech is suppressed and dissent is persecuted, the rise of extremism is almost inevitable. The absence of other political voice only makes this odds. This observation applies not only to Bangladesh, but to many other countries as well. Today, we urgently need to combat the growing authoritarianism and fascism around the world. To do this, we must create a cultural approach and that resonates the every, everyday people, inspire them, and raises awareness. We need to raise our voice
sorry. We need to raise our voice and create a cultural movement against all forms of authoritarianism and fascism, whether it's Trump to Khomeini or Saudi to Modi. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your rousing speech. Um, so we've got about uh, an hour or so. Um, so we're going to have about 10 minutes per person or try and uh, trim it in a little. And then after that, I'm going to open up the floor to questions. Um, so I'd like to start with you, if I, if I may. So you started uh, quite a while ago. In 1990, you began publishing, is it Should I Have Free Voice? And that became a platform for kind of unconventional writers in Bangladesh. Um, and uh, so I, I was wondering how has the landscape in terms of censorship changed since you started? Do you see any advancement or do you think we're backsliding? Or, and how would you personally begin to implement cultural change? Thank you very much. Um, the censorship and relevant all of the censorship, like blasphemy, like oppression, uh, the like uh, crisis of free speech, um, the history of our long long time from the very beginning uh, after getting the freedom um, uh, in 1971 the government was uh, established with commitment of secularism socialism and um, um, democracy but uh, they, they, they cannot uh, establish all of their commitment and we saw in 1974 one of poet, uh, his name is Daud Haider, he's living in now Germany. So he deported from Bangladesh for the blasphemy issue. Uh, and, and then we had a, uh, lots of, um, uh, from the 75 to 1990 was the, uh, the direct military uh, martial law uh, rule. And then we had a chance to uh, establish the um, democracy in Bangladesh. But unfortunately, our political party was failed to, uh, to do this there um, according to the uh, democracy. So they be also the one party rule, some kind of a uh, little bit uh, authoritarian. But uh, end of the moment we saw last 15 years ago when uh, the Awami League uh, came to the power. So we had a hope uh, maybe in this time uh, we will get the democracy, we will get the free speech, and we will get the uh, censorship free a democratic society and environment but anyhow uh, the Bangladeshi people's bad luck uh, they could not uh, get this and the government became a uh, the more authoritarian more fascist government so uh, and by this time um, you know that when uh, people cannot raise their voice so the extremist group uh, they, they, they became a, a more stronger in the underground. And in Bangladesh, it's same condition. After the uh, fascist government last 5th of August, uh, right now is very um, instability in Bangladesh. Um, one of the interim government are ruling the Bangladesh, but administration, law and orders, they are not working. But we saw the many fundamentalist group, they are, um, coming out as a pressure group to the government. And uh, I don't know uh, what happens with uh, 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 waiting for uh, the Bangladeshi people. So this is the situation. Okay, so uh, my next question is for um, Apostate Aladdin. Um, so I noticed on um, a few of your videos, there was quite um, a lot of backlash on Reddit, for example, when you were kind of doing some reasonable discourse and people were saying you were attacking kind of certain individuals and actually you, you just seemed totally reasonable to me when I um, saw the videos. 
um, and you seem to want to do things through kind of reason and discourse and just kind of thinking through things. Um, but there's this, there's this perception that there's, you know, the, either you're farming for outrage or you're being antagonistic. So I'm wondering um, what role has outrage culture or populism stifled the work kind of you're attempting to do? Because um, you've seen reasonable all the time I've seen you. And how do we change these perceptions in order to keep the conversation going? Um, and how can we push back against this positively while people are farming for outrage clicks? Um, I'd like to begin by saying that outrage is not necessarily productive, but it works. When it comes to getting attention, uh, that, that's why protests works. You know, the most outrageous protest is the one that gets the most attention. So it's not a, a condemnation of outrage, blanket condemnation. Uh, I've gotten into trouble with other activists, let's say, because it seems like they are stuck in a, the previous generation's mindset of you have to fight fire with fire. And I, I sympathize to some extent. I am privileged that I have come to the scene now. You know, it's only been a couple of years maybe. And it's only because a lot of people have paved the way for people like me to be here. Uh, they've taken the brunt of the force, you know, from uh, Islamists and, and other uh, critics of ex-Muslims, let's say. And all they've, they're used to is speaking their same language. And here I come, you know, trying to not necessarily appease believers, but speak to them in a way that they might understand, and at the same time, not compromise on what I'm saying. Um, so I think that's where most of the conflict lies. In terms of how to move forwards, I think just continue doing what I'm doing, uh, because I think it was surprising to me how much I've been able to get away with, things that are blasphemous, that are offensive to Muslims, uh, that Muslims themselves are accepting to some extent. Uh, for example, I have multiple videos where I draw the prophet in animation, not to make fun of his likeness, but to you know illustrate a story, to drive the point home. And there are Muslims who watch those, and they say, I know this is wrong, I know I shouldn't say this, but I'm actually, I find this funny. I think you kind of have a point. So pushing those boundaries has to be done, and sometimes outrage is necessary, but sometimes you could do things that were considered outrageous by, you know, by being nice enough about it, by being clear enough about exactly what it is that you mean, you can push the boundaries. So I, I think that's the way forward. Thank you. So, um, I'll say this again. So, um, they kind of self exclude when things turn hostile. So, how do we provide space um, to ensure they're not driven away and they can nurture their creative ideas? Because most of the time, um, when an environment turns hostile, um, say for example, if it's like a... Uh, there is nothing you can do. You uh, there's nothing you can do. That's like so I mean, in the moment, um, yeah. uh, like change the environment is not something that you can do. It's uh, not overnight, no. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what you can do is, uh, on a personal level, um, that you give support as mm -hmm. much as you can, or, is it, uh, or if it's an institution, uh, it would be like mental or um, psychological help, mm -hmm. uh, but I really don't think that um, that is very that's um, effective. I think that uh, to create the space is more uh, mentally to um, not blame the victim for saying anything, yeah. anything, even if like yeah they insult you, don't don't like yeah, exactly. let them uh, discharge, let them get rid of the charge they have and uh, don't put uh, judgments on them. Uh, that space that you can offer, but space in like the country where you are, that's not something you can offer. You can only offer to take them out and uh, help them to migrate somewhere. Okay. Um, yeah, and uh, it's, the, it's the same, like for me, freedom of expression is the real mm -hmm. therapy. Yeah, no, yeah. I agree. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so uh, this one is for uh, Sanal. So um, how do we uh, help instill and propagate civil movement values pertinent to us when the platforms we have to use to disseminate these um, appear to tend towards censorship themselves? So things, for example, like Instagram has started shutting people down. Um, you know, one platform like you know, uh, Twitter slash X seems to be okay, but still you know, doesn't quite do the job very well. So what strategies would you have to you know, getting our ideas out there which have worked positively for you? Uh, what should we do with the, the, the big organization like Indian Rationalist Association, which has more than 100,000 members, of course, in a country with 
billion population. It's a tiny, tiny organization if you consider the population. But the, the rationalists are scattered all over India and communication with them, for example, I as the, the person who was leading the organization for a long time is now in Finland for my security reasons, but still we use all the social media platforms so effectively to communicate to people. That's how we exist and that's how we work. One of the ways what we do is I have almost every week a Zoom meeting with uh, something like three to 4,000 people attending. That's scattered all over the country. And people can come in without identifying their name. So that's encouraged so that people are not afraid. So we use different platforms. One very popular platform in India is uh, uh, Facebook communication. Then there is uh, uh, a, a new app which is very popular uh, amongst people which is using only voice. And uh, that is also used abundantly. And most of these conversations that we make to people or discussions are recorded and published again and distributed. That's one of the ways we try to reach people. I started a publishing house back in 1981. And one of the first books that I published was Quran, A Critical Study. That is the first time I got a death threat. In many places in India where there is Muslim predominant population, I cannot still go. But now this book, for example, is produced in PDF and EPUB, and we are distributing it free of cost to anybody who is asking. That's, that's how we reach, and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of copies are distributed every year, I mean, over these years, and, and that's going on. But not only uh, this particular book, but every book that we produce, we are trying to bring in, uh, in, in the social media platform, freely available, also as uh, audiobooks in a very different form, like it's just read by somebody and, and put on uh, YouTube and available free of cost. That's one of the very interesting ways we try to reach people, and that works. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so this is for Vissam. So um, you're obviously a creative and a systemic thinker. So I was wondering, what role do you think um, using both creativity and systemic thinking has in advancing our causes while also preserving our rights to offend? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mariam, and everyone who has put the effort for uh, such a great event. This is uh, a great motivation and a push for all of us for the whole year. I know it takes a lot of sacrifice from everyone to, to put this together. Uh, the, the topic of uh, today, you know, censorship, and, and I'm going to come to your question uh, through it. But I wanted to uh, start where we've, we've left off from other conversations. Uh, which is, and I like what Maryam said, that this is a movement. It's a civil rights movement. It's a human rights movement. Now, uh, we identify as ex-Muslims, as former Muslims, as uh, people who are seeking freedom of religion, uh, freedom from religion. But uh, at the end, it's part of a bigger uh, movement. And I want to emphasize this because uh, the everything is connected in, in one way or another. and. When censorship happens in any, when uh, the freedom of expression is attacked, it affects our freedom of expression. Whether it is, uh, we are censored in, in two ways. We're politically censored and sometimes we are socially censored. So for example, I live in the United States of America in a city called Dearborn. Dearborn is one of the, it is the largest, uh, the city with the largest Arab population outside the Arab world. It's a city with its surroundings have 140 mosques, while there's only one cultural non-religious center. Uh, you can imagine the, 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 uh, it's the mood in the city. So uh, although the rules, they give you the freedom of expression, society will practice uh, uh, isolation, they'll practice defamation, they'll practice methods of censoring you and putting pressure on you. So we've, you know, we've created Muslimish. Uh, Muslimish is an, an organization that uh, is a space for uh, ex-Muslims, for questioning Muslims, to have a dialogue together. What we found is most Muslims are Muslimish. 
actually that is the secret of survival of Islam and other religions is that people don't take it too seriously. Every uh, we know one of our, part of our questionnaire for accepting members is do you question something in Islam? We rarely get no answer uh, for that. Uh, even even with people who are religious, uh, women who are wearing hijab, they still have uh, questions that there's things that they question about their religion. So that space encouraging that because every child is born an atheist and then they're indoctrinated with a religion. And then, uh, and then they start becoming questioning of, of, of that religion. And that questioning is suppressed at a very young age. Uh, they're suppressed in the mosque, they're suppressed in the school. Uh, we even, it's even suppressed at the highest levels. I, I've done Islamic studies before, and they suppress at the highest level. We have a statement in Islamic philosophy that says, al ajzu an al idraki idrak wal khawdu fi amr Allahi ishraq. The uh, not understanding, not fully understanding and comprehending is the comprehension. And uh, dwelling on the matter of the existence of God is apostasy. So uh, they shut down the dialogue at very early on with these, uh, you know, philosophical, poetical uh, statements. So uh, if we encourage questioning, then uh, you are creating the environment where, where, where that. But we also found that there are, we are sometimes lost in terminology. So for example, we understand an atheist in, in a certain way, but you know, my mother thinks an atheist is a person without morals. So what do we do with this language? It's just a difference in language. What, what's what's uh, sh the image that is in their mind when you say the word is different from the image when I say it. Uh, for them, religion is associated with morality. How do we cross these uh, bridges? So we created different forms uh, of, of secular work that reaches different people. We created uh, um, uh, salons, like in houses where dialogue is happening. There is wine, there is you know, an open, an uncensored uh, space, and we've created content from that. We created an organization called Free Thinking Society, Al Nadwa in Arabic. And we bring big secular speakers and the humanistic speakers from all over the Arab world to come speak in our area. We created another organization uh, called uh, Irshad. That was a, a, a legacy organization, but we support it as a reform Islam organization. Uh, last year, I became the first uh, Arab American uh, secular uh, celebrant in, uh, in Michigan. And I've officiated uh, many uh, um, uh, marriages uh, that were, you know, they had to go to a church before that or a mosque. Uh, and I, of I officiated the first gay marriage. I think I'm the first uh, Arab American to officiate a gay marriage. And when I gave that news to the Arab American news, I told them this is a historical thing. If you want to write about it, they said it's too controversial to write about it. <laughs> they were worried for me although they're also a secular newspaper. But I mean, these are all like steps trying to uh, deal with, uh, with, with the organization. We also created an organization called Arab American Center for Culture and Arts. Because what we found is a lot of people resort to Islam because they, they have an, a, a, a vacancy in their identity. They need an identity. And the Arab identity has been hijacked by Islam or has immersed in Islam somehow during the last 1500 years. So it has its own uh, culture. Every country has its own culture. It is a very colorful culture and we need to uh, bring it, you know, bring, bring its renaissance again. So, so children who uh, would like to belong, especially in America, you know, it's a multiracial, multicultural society that people like to identify with uh, um, a certain identity, to find that identity present that they can uh, connect with. I don't want to take more time, but. That was fantastic, thank you. Right, so we're going to go on to some general questions now. So the first one for the panel is, do you believe offense has taken cultural precedence over reason and evidence in relation to online presences? And if so, how is this affecting your work and how do you combat it? So who would like to go first? Yeah. Uh, so I wanna start with an anecdote about how I became apostate Aladdin. Before that, I was active in text-based forums, uh, trying to 
you know, figure out my, my beliefs in a sense, or more like talk to other people who have figured out theirs and find normalcy in being an ex-Muslim. And those spaces were constantly raided by Muslims who were offended by what we said or by the existence of ex-Muslims in general. And it was because of that, because of their targeted attacks, because of offense, that I rose to the role of a um, moderator in those spaces. And it was further attacks and further attempts to dox other ex-Muslims that sort of led me to connect with those ex-Muslims and give them a heads up that, hey, you, you might have been doxed. Turns out it wasn't a real threat, thankfully. And so in, in an ironic twist of fate, if it wasn't for people getting so offended that they started insulting and intimidating, I don't know if I'd ever start a YouTube channel. I, I'm not the kind of person who, who really thinks that what I say matters or that I really want people to listen to me. So I was happy doing the work behind the work, uh, behind the, the, uh, the, I guess, behind the front line. And then that connection I made with a YouTuber made me the person that I am today or started this, this journey. So if it wasn't for the, the, the backlash, if it wasn't for the offense, I wouldn't be here. So I'm not saying that it's a good thing but it's, it's ironic and I'm grateful for it. Um, as, as it. As it has to do with my work today, I'll, I'll speak for myself, people will get offended no matter how you say what you say, no matter what you say. Um, so if I were to try to tailor my approach to specifically Muslims and their sensibilities and how to not offend them, you could do that, you know, and there is a space for that. But I found that it's almost futile and it's sort of, it's pushing the boundaries backwards rather than pushing them forwards. And so I don't really censor myself whatsoever. I still receive offense, but if you put enough of yourself out there and explain yourself well enough, then enough people will understand that you come from a good place, that you don't necessarily intend to offend. And like I was saying earlier, that, that is a valid strategy to get attention, is to go for the most outrageous thing. Uh, but people understand that and people don't necessarily take kindly to that. If they know that you're trying to offend them, they stopped listening as soon as they got offended. Uh, even if they understand it, it's just a strategy. So my approach has been, I'll offend some people along the way, and that's okay. I'm not going to tailor my approach to them, but I'm not out to try to piss them off or to try to win back some points uh, for my side. So yeah, it has affected my work to some extent, but it hasn't been a barrier. I can tell an example from India and the, the transformation that was happening in India in, in ways of uh, the public tolerance or, or the, the system's tolerance towards things. In 1995, the, some 18 volunteers of the Indian Rationalist Association traveled across the country, reaching out millions of people in 18 months I'm talking directly to people, and it was a very popular thing. We started as a very small thing, but later it was reported all around the world, and uh, Robert Eagle from BBC came to India and traveled with us, and he made a documentary and called me the Guru Buster. <laughs> he explained all guru tricks everywhere, and simply friendly talk to people and equip them to handle these tricks. And there was no offense. Nobody was attacked in all the 18 months, but later, the television times come, and I became very popular on Indian television, attending regularly television programs. First, it was very much welcomed, but eventually, I saw the turn of events. In many programs, the, the guru representative shout, kill him, in the program live. But not only gurus, but also from other groups. For example, uh, once, once, for example, on a television program, a guru said, he should be killed and I can kill him with magic. I offered myself to be killed. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a program which is available in YouTube. Maybe millions of people have seen it. It was very simple that he chanted mantras to have a painful death for me live on television. I volunteered and sat and st stood there for nearly one hour <laughs> and I was not dying. <laughs> And he, wa and he wanted an extended 10 minutes to kill me. <laughs> okay, it was granted. I could not speak much. He was chanting mandras all the time. All I could do was making some comic gestures to mock him. That was the only thing I could do. But at the end, he said he's protected by some other gods. Okay, I said I'm an atheist.
But then there was another program immediately planned. That's, that's a super mantra. That's an ultimate tantra challenge. And he wanted to take me to a burial place in front of the fire. And then he would do the magic. There is no protection possible. Protection magic that I was doing. That's what he was trying to tell. And in nine minutes, I would be killed with extreme pain. The television promoted it day in and day out. I mean, I mean for, for several, every 10 minutes, they have been promoting it. It got the highest ever viewership on Indian television <laughs> history. Life, one hour in front of fire and magic, he was trying to kill me. <laughs> and at the end of it, I was clapping and said that your magic would not work. He's out of business. And now he's practicing the same kind of tantra in South Africa wow. amongst Indians. I mean, that was one situation. But I was physically attacked in front of television with fire. One by one, Walti Baba, I had to run for my life. And above all, on a television program, and I explained a, a, a miracle in, in a Mumbai church, the bishop himself wanted to stop it. And he came to the studio and wanted to debate with me. I made, I mean, I mean, considerable jokes about the Christian faith, and it ended that the bishop was angry and he left, and the studio was covered by a lot of, I mean, goons with the long sticks to attack me. I had to escape later from a back door, and 27 blasphemy cases against me. And it was reported all around the world, but no Indian television spoke about that at the time, because India was ruled at the time by Congress Party's government, and its president was a Roman Catholic from Italy by marriage, I mean, uh, Sonia Gandhi. I mean, perhaps she did not know it, but the general feeling was uh, if anybody speak against the Roman Catholic Church, that would be offensive to the government. Well, that's an important thing. Roman Catholic Church owns the, he, Roman Catholic Church is the largest owner of property, landed property in India after government of India. It, the Christians have only two percent. Yeah, Christians have only two percent of population in India, but it ha it has the biggest corporate empire in India. So nobody wants to touch them. So finally, I had to escape from India to save my life. In my experience, I think motivation is very important for uh, changing that. Uh, environment and uh, everything. Uh, I remember uh, when I came out from my religious identity, uh, it was at the very early stage of, uh, in my life. Early stage means early young stage. So yeah, last two years ago, I shared with Dan in Colon this story. So <coughs> after that, uh, yeah, I was also involved in as like as the, uh, the Turkish brother as a uh, Islamic organization and then I uh, anyhow realized, and I understand, and I come out. So then um, I, uh, and then I found uh, some of other friend also, they come out from uh, this kind of activities and also the believeness. So then we tried to um, motivate some others people, and we were successfully uh, do this, and people, many people come out uh, because uh, I think it's motivating them intellectually. So uh, and and then uh, from f from that time actually we were started the little magazine and we uh, it's kind of the activism of writing and publishing. So still now I believe uh, as part the Bangladesh uh, consider consideration. So the motivation is very important because I believe which criticism um, I can do against of the Khomeini or Salman. So. Uh, I cannot uh, do same theory. I cannot apply same theory to my the farmers, uh, uh, the population in Bangladesh, who are the very normal, uneducated, and their believeness is different. Okay, so for that, uh, still now I believe, and I am working, uh, motivating people, and try to aware people and inspire people for the tolerance, for the progressiveness. So I hope uh, if we can do this and people can absorb this, so then people day by day come out from any kind of, all kind of extremism and radicalism. Brilliant. Thank you so much. That's, that's right on time. Thank you.
Right, so now we have 10 minutes for questions. Um, sorry, did you want to say something? Sorry. Yeah. I didn't see, sorry, I was on the side. Um, I would say that um, uh, blasphemy is important for Muslim people to work out their brain. They need to be provoked, even if they don't like it, but that's the way to open up their mind, and uh, they will refuse and resist and threat, and then they will discuss, and this is my experience. It's very rare. It's very rare to find someone who is open without reason, like, like uh, willingly ready to, uh, to uh, uh, receive information. And uh, on the other hand, uh, the non-Muslim people need crime rate to go higher so they understand. So both sides need some violence, some uh, push, like now some provoking to understand or to open up and get what's the problem with that ideology. Yeah. And uh, I wanted I wanted to rephrase uh, your uh, I agree with you totally, Sam. And I would like to replace the word uh, uh, of uh, like you, you said that something like removing their identity. Like I would say Islam replaced the individual ident identity in each person, because when they are children, they ask and they um, get blamed for asking, and they are ordered not to think, not to because it's. Uh, prohibited, it's haram, it's from the devil. Uh, so yeah, like take it as it is, like no critical thinking. And this is um, not you. They put someone else and this other person is great and uh, uh, you can be proud of that person already, like ready made. So they even don't try to be great because they already have it. That's th what's make them entitled and um, what make them like uh, feeling like they are better than everyone else for no reason. That's it. Uh, so I'll, I'll be quick. I have a YouTube channel, so I talk all the time, so I don't want to take too much of your time. Um, I want to correct something I said earlier. I said that it hasn't been a barrier. Offense, you know, Muslims' offense has not been a barrier. What I meant to say is it hasn't been a fatal barrier. I still continue my work despite of it. But my channel is uh, blocked in Pakistan, the entire channel. and. Yeah, and, and I take that as, as a badge of honor to, to some extent. And a lot of my videos are also blocked in Malaysia. And what really started off the, that blocking spree was videos that I made that were critical of Muhammad's marriage to a child. So they're okay with you making videos talking about child marriage in a positive light, but you know, say that it's bad, and, but somehow it's not Islam. Um, so it, that is a barrier because there are hundreds of millions of people who will never get to hear my voice or my perspective just because you know, a government official decided so. And I also want to add really quickly that censorship doesn't just hurt us as critics of Islam or ex-Muslims, it hurts Muslims the most by numbers. Uh, because if you just look at the text, at the scripture, be it the Quran, the Hadith, the exegesis, the tafsir, there is a very clear and easy avenue towards fundamentalism. I mean, you could find ex uh, explanations that, that make things rosy and pretty, but if, you, if you're just left with the books, fundamentalism makes the most sense. You know, you got to follow God's words uh, as close as possible just to be safe, just so you don't get tortured forever. Even if, you know, for your loved ones, you have to force them to follow Islam because that's better than them getting tortured. So because of that censorship against any more mild, I guess, uh, interpretations of Islam, uh, because there can never be a new Quran or uh, a new exegesis of the Quran that is widely shared, there can only be institutions like um, Yaqeen Institute that just sort of give... Um, Taqween? No, I'm, I'm talking about Yaqeen, it's, it's a different one. Um, they just give apologetics for the things that Muhammad did, not actually saying that it's a bad thing, just more like it made sense back then. But that's not really gonna change things moving forward, that's not gonna do anything for someone who is suffering under that. It's just PR for Islam. So if Muslims of all uh, sorts of, of, of beliefs don't get a chance to express their opinions and change things more permanently, then the moderates are underrepresented. The extremists, as we see them as extremists, are actually overrepresented. So that hurts Muslims a lot. And like um, another panelist yesterday, Muhammad Hisham, was saying that we need a new Islam because we can't expect every Muslim to leave Islam like we did. That's just unrealistic. And a new Islam can never happen with censorship and no free speech. So for the sake of Muslims, they need more of what we do. And they should see us as allies rather than enemies. And, and I maintain that every day that you shouldn't hate me, you should 
be more angry at the person who misrepresents your belief. Why then wouldn't they speak up to themselves? Well, because of the censorship that they're imposing no, on No, 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 no. Like, they don't refuse ISIS war. They, they never protested that. But they would protest someone uh, uh, burning the Quran. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm not saying that. Like, th this is, these people are ruining their image, and they are so silent about it. They're not doing anything. I, I know. I'm not saying that Muslims are faultless in this. I'm saying, I'm actually trying to Sorry, get, bring their nervous. attention to it. <laughs> Th that's okay. I, I'm trying to bring their attention to how their silence and their complicitness is They like them. it. <laughs> I mean, do you, you think that Muslims like being oppressed? Yes. I, I guess we have to agree. Yes, they are terrorists in small manners, like in, in their own houses. No, I, and I don't disagree with that. I, I want to say something. I found an expression uh, uh, called letzists. Do you know it? Letzists. No. It's uh, very important. Uh, it def a definition is that people uh, who call themselves uh, Christians or followers of any religion based on cultural identification without believing in the teachings of that particular religion. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a um, yeah, and like, I mean, um, it's considered uh, a religion to be let's for any religion. You are, this is a, um, a branch because I was digging up uh, like um, the, uh, the religion, the history of religion, like as religion as um, a science. So let's just, is a branch of it, but we never used it. And it applies for 90% or 80% of the Muslim people. Yeah, we, we think that they're Muslimish. Like that's what we yeah. call them. Yeah, this is the made up, but I found the scientific one. <laughs> uh, sorry. Can, can I add something to the conversation? Sure. Um, so I just want to emphasize the role of all humanist and all civil and human rights uh, movements in inspiring us and encouraging us and this work is not disconnected like we uh, one of the things that affected me the most are the scientists who came out and spoke like dr richard uh, dawkins we have professor lawrence cross here i want to say a little uh, uh, story about that so for i was a member of an islamic dialogue group and i, and I stayed in it and each person has the turn to give a lecture and then they have discussion with scholars and philosophers. So when the turn came to me, I told them it's gonna be a very controversial lecture. He said, it's okay, we, you're, you're not censored. So uh, I was kicked out of the organization after that <laughs> lecture. But uh, the lecture was why do the classical proofs of God don't work anymore? And after I gave that lecture, it, there were very heated discussion that they made another a lecture just to have a discussion on it, and that discussion wasn't enough. And we stuck on one, w w me and, and one of the philosophers said, we're gonna do an exchange in writing of the dialogue about this, and it was focused on how can something come from nothing. And I relied heavily on the book of Professor Cross, Universe from Nothing, and I've actually published this discussion now, and it's gonna be published in Iraq and Lebanon and distributed. Hiwar Kaun Min Adam in Arabic. I feel there's a lot of uh, literature in English, uh, but we need more literature in Arabic. And that's one of our role in the West as, as uh, free thinkers is that we can, we are to a certain extent not uncensored uh, and we can write and uh, create content. Thanks for everyone here to, that creates contents for the, for the East. And so in the matters of uh, freedom of speech and freedom of expression, when you are silent about any individual, like the, the prosecution of Assange or the uh, uh, prosecution of Snowden as a whistleblower and etc., that creates a fragment in all our movement and makes our work harder. So standing up to, to freedom of expression and against censorship in any area inspires us and encourages us and actually is helping every freedom of expression everywhere. Fantastic, thank you. So um, we've only got a little bit of time left, so are there any questions? Well, so, okay, so just, sorry, yeah. So, so I have a question from the gentleman from, in, from India. How is it possible that the Catholic Church can own so much in a country like India, where we even have like a Hindu national movement controlling the country? How is, how is that even possible? Yeah, 
that's an interesting question. Uh, the, when British I mean, power leaves India in 1947, they gave out most of the landed property owned by them to different Christian groups. And majority of them went to the Catholic Church because they opposed Indian independence struggle. And they got, I mean, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you can search the internet, you can see that the largest, I mean, non-agricultural land owner India in India is the Catholic Church. And the second largest land owner, which is not agricultural land, is the Wakaf board. That's the Muslim board. And the, then comes the third one, some Hindu trusts. So this is something unbelievable. The influence of the Catholic Church in India is enormous. Also, the Indian Catholic Church influenced the global Catholic Church in a very big way because 72% of the global nuns go from India. And of them, 91% goes from two districts in Kerala, and one of which I am coming from. And, and, and all these nuns are getting salaries. For example, if you work in a university, you get the salary paid by the government, but the money does not go to them but to the church. One third goes to Vatican, one third to the, the bishop of the diocese, and one third to the mother superior. And that's the major income of the church, and the landed property comes from the British gifting them. Okay, so is there anybody else? I just I want maybe. to ask to panel, uh, everyone. Uh, first of all, everyone of us, I'm sure, know that uh, freedom of speech is the biggest enemy of any totalitarian uh, ideologies. Of course, enemy of Islam, too. So, but uh, w what I'm wondering, in the West, there is a censorship going on many social media platforms and uh, political left and right uh, fighting each other and uh, doing... Uh, what do you think, guys and girls, who is behind this censorship? Who will you fight against to stop this censorship? I, I just want to have clear what you think. Business who is and behind money. the censorship money in, in the business, West? Business and money. Money. Yeah, I, I agree with, with what she said. Uh, even not having financing is a form of censorship. You know, it doesn't have to be explicitly censorship. So there's, there's no money to be made in controversial things, you know, talking about Islam in a controversial way. People don't want to back that up. News stations don't want to back that up. So money's a big factor, yeah. yeah. So I think, Sally, that's all we have time for, but can you please give a very, very big round of applause from my wonderful esteemed panel? Thank you so much.